So that brings us up then uh, to the new church that was constructed in uh, the early 60s in Desert Agni. I remember the new church being opened. I had been an altar boy in the old church and then I had gone to secondary school in Cairndunna. I was 15 at the time. So, but uh, Father Tom, as we call him, Father Tom Doherty, asked three or four of us of the older clerks to come back because uh, he wanted to bulk up the, the, the altar boys for, for that day with all the bishop and everything being there. And so I was asked to come back and I am I in some of the photographs holding the, the cross there. We thought at the time, being young, we thought it was a great improvement. This new church was bright and airy and the, the windows, everything was so, so modern and nice and we thought, why not? It's not a great progress. The roof was, was very innovative, you know, of this an upside down cora, you know, which was which appealed to us all because we were all interested in fishing and stuff about here and there was the star of the sea and this cora upside down, whatever, you know, all fitted in and what was the locality, whatever. So that was, um, we are all delighted with it. In 1964, Star of the Sea Church was dedicated in a splendid ceremony before a packed congregation. Quite a few of the people who were there that day were back today, and some of the priests too. And from the look of things, time has been as kind to them as it has been to this building that we stand beside. A French thinker from the 12th century once said, We are like dwarves standing on the shoulders of giants. And this is so true when we look back. But those whose vision and commitment we recall from 50 years ago were themselves standing on the broad shoulders of centuries of faith and prayer which have pervaded these hillsides and valleys since the time of St. Patrick himself. Our responsibility now is to see to it that that noble tradition be kept alive, to enhance it in our own time, and that whilst hunger and persecution may have previously been the challenges which our forebearers faced, in our own times we face other challenges to faith, but the same grace which guided them, hopefully, will not be found wanting in us either. There has always been a great bond between the people and their priests in this parish. I remember the old church being knocked down. And I remember this, the new church here, Start of the Sea, being built. I was too young to appreciate the architecture of it then, but looking around it now, it's superb. What struck me about the new church at its opening were two things. First of all, it was a beautiful white building, which was very significant. And also, I remember Bishop Farn, who opened it, and I remember him with all the long trails and about six or seven altar servers holding up this trail behind him. So, and this entourage uh, coming into the church and the church being packed. So again, very significant memories. I can't remember anything very specific. It was, I was a young priest, a young priest of a few years ordination. And at that time, when a church was being blessed, the clergy generally felt invited, wherever they, be, wherever they lived, whatever part of the diocese they belonged to. So I'm not clear now as to whether I had an invitation or I just came with my own accord. But I remember the ceremony as a nice uh, an occasion, a nice occasion for the area and it was certainly a new idea in church building. Coming from, as I did from Carndona, the architecture was slightly different in Desertegne, but each has its own merit, and we're not going to adjudicate between the two of them. I wasn't here the day it was opened. I was a boy in St. Columns at that time, and it was all the, the, the talk in 1964 of the country. Uh, this modern building uh, out beyond Boncrana, uh, much talked about. It was modern, but uh, not too modern. Uh, it didn't uh, frighten uh, traditionalists. The church was designed, as you know, by Liam McCormick, uh, who has made a name for himself as the premier church architect 
in Ireland in the last century. There are a lot of features of this church that uh, suggest that Liam McCormick was entered in the sea and in boats. Uh, the nave of the church, uh, navis, nave, means uh, a ship in Latin. Uh, at the top up in the sanctuary you've got the prow shaped and here we're standing uh, at the back of the church uh, and it, this baptistry area and the gallery above us uh, is also like part of uh, a ship. Uh, the tower outside, uh, people have likened it to a lighthouse. Uh, McCormick uh, spent much of his time in Greencastle, County Donegal, by the sea. Uh, he had a boat himself and they say that of all uh, his 30 or so churches, the one at Desert Hagney is the one he liked most because he could view it from his boat when it was out on the Swilly. And uh, it, uh, I think, excited uh, the maritime uh, side of the architect. The parish priest, uh, Father O'Brien at the time, wanted the church to be uh, on the site of the old church. Uh, McCormick successfully pushed uh, a more elevated site that, uh, that was accepted uh, ultimately. Liam McCormick, even from the beginning of uh, setting out on a project, his selection of site or his, uh, his uh, knowledge of the site uh, was always uh, of foremost uh, importance to him. He had to have the, his building, what he talk, talked about has been socially correct for its uh, function uh, and purpose. By which he meant it fitted to its uh, locality, it fitted into its landscape, and it served the purpose for which it was being designed. In other words, the church for the people and uh, that was very important to him. You can see from the Star of the Sea here how well it is sighted, beautifully sighted, and uh, the name itself uh, suggests uh, what was the back of his mind, and that was that's come from the old church, but the appearance of the church, its whole form and, uh, and the rest, that comes from his uh, affinity with the sea and his love of sailing. Uh, so these are, these are all these influences are married together, and and that gives him a starting point maybe for, uh, for how the building is going to look. He had a certain vision for the, the type of architecture he wanted to produce uh, from his days at college obviously and it was essentially based on modern movement philosophy. The modern movement in the arts and architecture of the 20th century was the clean, sharp line, clear cut uh, type of forms, you know, with no decoration or embellishment in that respect. But uh, he developed his own particular type of modernism in his churches. You could say that the, uh, the signature materials of Lee McCormick for a great number of churches is the great white walls, or maybe another, uh, an alternative is the big slated roof. So you, you see that those two type of forms come, uh, come, into, uh, come into being, you know, with, uh, especially with Law. Uh, as an example of the great white wall, and you have it here in its earlier form, you know. But uh, lentis, you get the great slated roof, which the roof is the important element, whereas in this here, the wall is the important element. It was uh, forward thinking, uh, and uh, there was always a reaction to the new from uh, the forces of. Uh, conservatism, if you like, within the church in this case. Uh, but uh, that happens all the time, uh, even in, the, in art and architecture generally, you know. Liam McCormick was very approachable, so he was, and very, uh, very understanding and supportive of young architects. He was a very uh, uh, jovial man, and he was a great storyteller. He could tell stories to the cows come home, as it were, about his... Uh, uh, episodes with Paris priests, the rent length and breadth of the country. He was, uh, shall we say, well known for changing things on site. <laughs> and uh, uh, that uh, in those days gone by, uh, there was more flexibility with uh, builders. 
McCormick never gave you many plans, you know, that's right. He'd kind of, you'd say, okay, Johnny, or, or Michael, you'd say, listen, I want this done this way, and he'd probably draw it out in a cigarette box. That's all you uh, got. Uh, you know, there's no sort of, uh, there's no plans or anything. Just, uh, he'd create something there and then, and then you were meant to do it, isn't that right? That's right, yeah. yeah. He has been very influential in the uh, Irish church architecture. Uh, from the, the mid 50s on, right up into the uh, 70s, 80s. He's built churches all over Ireland, maybe 25, 26 of them. Can't remember the exact number now. And he's built some in England as well, like three churches, I think, he's built in England. He won the Triennial Gold Medal of the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland for the Birch Church, uh, which is a very prestigious award indeed. He's been referred to as the father of church architecture in Ireland. McCormick and Bishop Farn would have known each other from St. Columns. Bishop Farn would have been a teacher in St. Columns when McCormick was a boy there. Similarly, Bishop McFeely in Rafu, where many of the other McCormick churches are to be found. Uh, that is something that isn't stressed, but I think should be acknowledged, uh, the connection between uh, McCormick and clergy uh, with whom he had been a pupil or by whom he had been taught. He also got on very well uh, with Johnny Hegarty the builder and Hegarty was ultimately to build five of the McCormick churches that you can find in County Donegal. Of course the, the vision of the architect and artist can only be realised in a completed building. Johnny Haggerty of Bunkrana was the contractor who brought it all together in this church. McCormick often paid tribute to Johnny Haggerty for the energy and dedication he brought to his work and especially commended him on the skills and enthusiasm shown by his fine team of tradesmen, and craftsmen and others of his workforce. John Haggerty was a very, very sharp man. Your work had to be a one or he'd make you take it down again. Now, I've seen him doing it to different people, like, you know what I mean? He, he was very, very sharp, very, very keen, very, very keen eye, like, you know, and I, I think he's, he's a, he was a joiner himself, which gave him a great advantage. He knew what he was talking about, he knew, he knew, and he was a great man to work for. It wasn't one of these boys that come up and see something that you were making and walk down the stairs again. He'd compliment you on, if it was a good job, you know, what if it was the other way about? He would just say, that's not, that's not up to standard, it's not up to my standard, like, you know what I mean? We don't put out work like that. And that was a type of John Higgard a pleasure to work for. Every man on the job had done their bit, you know what I mean? You had my father, Uncle Michael, Paddy McDevitt, John the Twin, Marcus, you know, yourself, Marcus Flaherty, yeah. I, I don't know, yeah. Bernie Bradley and Mickey Lynch, they were all the builders, yeah. weren't they? Yeah, all the builders, yeah. I, I, I don't know, you know more uh, yeah. who was on that job than me, eh? Well, John, uh, Johnny McDade, uh, over right. the, uh, around the fallout there, he was one of the main builders. Mickey Lynch, yeah. uh, Barney, Bradley. Barney Bradley, Joe Bradley, that's about that build, all the builders, you know. And who's the joiners? The joiners were Marcus Flaherty, Adam McDevitt, Frank Harrigan. Uh, Charlie McLaughlin of Inch Road. Brian Carter and John at one. John McLaughlin, that was it. I was coming on a bicycle from Inch to Burntana to be there at 48 o'clock. If you were coming on the gate, we Johnny would be pulling up the sleeve and looking at the time. Me and uh, Frank Harrigan and Robert Kidd was near enough in the van go uh, at the time. We would cycle together. And then in the evening you take a bike up again and you only got the one break. There are no such thing as stopping at 10 o'clock or... <laughs> like whenever I look at some of the boys walking now, <laughs> you know, it's, it's powerful just. 12 pounds 60 or something it was for the first week I got here. I done all the doors. I hung the doors and all that there. And at the making of these tents here, and all the architect and all that. Wonders, I, 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 my hands wore of myself. I had to scrape them wonders up there. They were cut where I, I saw in the shade on the workshop. There were circles all there, and McDevitt would 
on that end of it. The round was cut, and then they were, as I say, they were stripping it, and then to get them cleaned up. I spoke shave on a plane and a, a scraper, and I finished up with a bit of glass on it to get them finished up. The the grain was that sharp in them, like a plane was no good to them at that time. Like if you were were on the straight, you were alright, but on the bend. You were just scraping away. And you spent days at it. Days and days and days. But Barney Bradley and Joe Bradley and them would be them was the boys that built them up. Brian Carter was a great man. Brian on the roof here. Ramped on the on the roof work. I'm and John McLaughlin. That's a lovely building. The last for the next hundred years. And you had the labourers, Paddy Green. Barney Wan, I should be called him Barney, Barney McLaughlin. Something Green was a lorry driver. That's right. I did mention it. Uh, Paddy, Paddy McLaughlin, Paddy Potts, we called him. He was, even, he was one of the labourers in that job too. Sure. Wally Do, up in Conglash, that was another labourer. Charlie McKerra, all them boys were on that job. Dan with old Dan too. Dan McLaughlin, that's right. right. Dan was there yeah, too. That's right. Uh, <laughs> it was all done by hand, you know, digging and picking and the shovel and all that type of thing. All the heavy work was done by hand. <laughs> Workshop was that was where everything was made up. This all the seats so were all made. All the seats were made there yeah. too, yeah. And they were taken down to the hall to get varnished and polished. All the seats were taken yeah. down to the parish hall there. We had a spindle. We had uh, planers. We had bandsaws. I look, look, look at the the amends there now. They were cut freehand by a bandsaw. Well, when it was cut by the bandsaw, it left a sort of no matter of fine a blade yet on it. There was a roughage age, which all then had to be hand hand on with a spoke shave. And mind you, it wasn't easy. And to keep it square, you know what I mean? And that all had to be hand on, you know. The wonders came the same way. Material had to be run. No real power sanders. Blocks you use, block with sandpaper and things like that there. Tedious work, like, you know what I mean? All woodwork, the furniture that's in the chapel here was all produced in the workshop. The oh, workshop one, at one time was a big, big place, wasn't it? Yeah, sure. You know, it was, now it's closed up, but I mean, machinery it, it. all the machinery is still there, like you know. But I mean, at, at one time, even the Burt Chapel and those seats were very, uh, you know, they were curved, you know. Uh, and they, they were, were all made there. And, all uh, dish seats as well, you know. They were and the roof for the Burt Chapel and for this chapel, I mean, it was un unbelievable. When the, the balcony was built, there was a template cut and plywood. And if you look at that balcony, the material that's in it is very, very heavy. What's wise and, uh, and depth, it's very, very heavy. And it is cut and the shape and jointed as it was put up here. But that all had to be shaped in the workshop. And there was no great system. After you, you couldn't use a machine on it. Do you know what I mean? You use practically hand tools like you know, to get it tapered. You know, and uh, that's quite effective and it's lovely looking. Paddy McDevitt, he came from Glenty, as I say, and my father would have trained him up, wouldn't he? Yeah, he was, uh, he was, I think it was actually yeah. your uncle Phil met him. He took him to McCrack. That's right, yeah. Phil was. Phil was working at the Glenty's the factory yeah. over there. So McDevitt then, he, Paddy, God rest him too, and uh, he would have made all the, you know, he'd have been the head, head joiner in the workshop, wouldn't he? Oh, he would be, yeah. Uh, Paddy's great head in him. Uh, good man. Very clever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just loved working with these men and this type of quality of work. Memory goes back to Paddy McDevitt. He was a fantastic, he had a great head. He was a great joiner, one of the best. You know, one of the best, I would say, that, that I met in my time. Good as Paddy McDevitt come up with, he cut a circle, circle, and, and halved, halved it. it in two so. and clamped it together. Whereas you look at the, the bottom of your straight edge or something and here you cut the neck for the neck straight edge. And then you end up and done the same here. You were going out but your straight edge was still going around it. Everything was a sur everything as you see inside it yourself is it's all a surround. You can't put a straight edge in that. And you know what we're straightening with? Tubes of tires. Stretched, you stretched them as much as you could, whatever wee bit of strength you had. You, you stretched the tire and you come over the thing to flatten it in. It was a wild interesting work. 
George would have done all them wonders on his own. They were, they were, they were yeah, tight work. They, they were splayed as well. Or all the wonders were splayed. You know, all had to be lined. Everything. But the ceilings, I remember, were all stippled, and it's very hard. You know, we get six or seven plasters on the one ceiling. You know, the stipple at the same, get the same stipple on. It wasn't easy, like you know what I mean. We're just using sponges, weren't we? Just ordinary and sponges, cares, yeah. pull them apart. As I say, there were, there were plasters there from from Derry, and I think there was one from Stirvan as well. Macaulay's the word. There were, yeah. were two brothers, one from Stirvan, oh, from Derry. That's right. That's what it was. I remember Mickey Haggerty starting up there in the top of that, starting to paint it. Only it's moving yet. I swear, <laughs> the <a> snowman. <laughs> You know, you mind all them comical things, yeah. and you know to think that, that uh, coming up there, you know, and about ten or twenty men sitting on each side of that roof, shining. You, you think it was uh, the, the brasses in their own mantelpiece that were shining. You know, cleaning the copper roof. Mm. You wouldn't get to see these men go up in the stock and feet now. They mm. take off your shoes too. <laughs> Oh yeah, at least we, at least we pebble through the. I mean, I mean, like, the, I mean, like what the damage the damage the copper, the, the copper, you know. Yeah. God rest Johnny Murphy, right when I got that way too. Oh yeah. When you filled the bucket full of dash before you put it into the mixer, he smoothed it off your hand, mm. poured it into the mixer. It had to be all the wine colour. Mm. Yet it was going to be painted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. I remember your man sowing the grass you know? in the front, what do they call him? Uh, Dennis. Dennis. Dennis was glory. I remember him with a fiddle, sowing the grass with the, with the fiddle. That was mm -hmm. at the front bit there. I remember that very well now. You had a pride in your work to get other work. Mm. Work wasn't that plentiful other days, Ian. You know, you had to be kind of A1 to get the licks of a chapel anyway, yeah. like, like I say, you know. What you did do after, you know, we done worked and we done. I done some good work. Kerry Keeler around there, you know, and I, you know, got a fair share of it that time, and that was only through this chapel here, you know. McCormick never give you many plans, you know, that's right. He'd kind of, you'd say, okay, Johnny, or, or Michael, you'd say, listen, I want this done this way, and he'd probably draw it out in a cigarette box. That's all you uh, got. Uh, you know, there's no sort of, uh, there's no plans or anything. Just, uh, he'd create something there and then, and then you were meant to do it, isn't that right? That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Liam McCormick, he used his churches uh, to showcase the work of artists and three artists were involved uh, in the creation of the stained glass windows. Uh, the stained glass window here behind me is the work of George Campbell. George Campbell is held in very high regard uh, in the art world uh, in Ireland uh, but also in Spain. In Ireland and in Spain he's considered one of the significant artists of the last century. He's Irish and he's also Protestant uh, and I think that's of significance because another famous uh, artist was Evie Hone and she converted to Catholicism and a window that she created is to be found in the uh, Church of Ireland Church at Fawn, St. Mura's Church. So there's a Catholic artist in a Protestant church and she's famous for her uh, craftsmanship and George Campbell, a Protestant, uh, equally uh, famous as an artist here in the Catholic Church in Desert Tegney. The window itself uh, is uh, very, very striking. Uh, you'll see that Campbell was a cubist. Do you see the the triangles and uh, Christ is a triangular figure and uh, he, he was a, a committed cubist. John the Baptist is the patron saint of baptistries and he's given recognition uh, in uh, many pre-Vatican II churches uh, and the, the little baptistries are named after him. Uh, he was the cousin of the Lord. He baptized the Lord in the Jordan. To have this window here in our parish of Bonkrana uh, really uh, delights me and uh, thrills me. Of, of the other windows, eight of them are by an artist called Helen Maloney. Her uncle was the young patriot Kevin Barry. She herself was apolitical. She had another famous relative, her sister, 
was the, the wife of Patrick Kavanagh, uh, the poet. I talked to her on the phone a number of years ago. She died in 2011 and uh, I tried to pick her brains about her windows and uh, what she had meant by them. Uh, four of them uh, honour the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the ox, the eagle, the lion and uh, a man, a man for John. Uh, they're up in the sanctuary because that's where the word of the Lord is read and where the works uh, written by the evangelists are proclaimed uh, in the gospel passages that are read there during Mass and at other services and paraliturgies. Over the sacristy door uh, there's a window by Helen Maloney uh, that depicts the Arma Christi the arms of Christ, things like the lance and the nails uh, that remind us of his crucifixion and of his battle uh, with evil and his triumph over it. The other windows that she have have maritime imagery, uh, boats and sails and seamen uh, and uh, waves, uh, things like that. The four windows in the middle of the church are by Margaret Becker. She was a very young woman when she designed her four windows in the church here. Three of them commemorate the patrons of Ireland, St. Patrick, St. Bridget and St. Colum Kill. Uh, and one of them is devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary. It reminds us of Our Lady's role at the foot of the cross. Star of the Sea imagery is conveyed by the, the mosaic on the wall outside the church by uh, Imogen Stewart. Imogen Stewart is one of the very famous sculptors of the 20th century. A German lady, she was born in uh, Berlin. Uh, she's still alive. As far as I remember, she's 88. She is a member of Ace Dana as was Helen Maloney, uh, so their calibre is recognised uh, throughout the country. The two windows over the doors are what I call armorial windows. Uh, they have the arms the, uh, of the Pope, one of them, and the other one, the Bishop, who were uh, in office in 1964 when the church was opened. Pope Pius VI, who was at one stage in his career, was, as far as I can remember, Archbishop of Milan. His arms, like all papal arms, uh, contain two keys, uh, the keys of Peter, and uh, one of them is always gold and the other is always silver. The other arms, Neil Farns, his coat of arms contains three mitres that uh, remind us of the three parts of the diocese that were exist in existence in medieval times, Ardstraw, Mahara and Derry. In his arms also there's the Udaharty Keep in Boncrana because Neil Farn was born in Boncrana in 1893. His motto uh, in English means, Thy will be done. People think that his motto should have been, my will be done, but <laughs> I, I jest. I'm his last ordination. <laughs> he ordained me in 1973, so I should feel grateful to him. And uh, my, my, my joke is made uh, most lightheartedly. The windows replace statues. It's, it's a message that's very hard to get across to people, that there's no need for statues in this particular church. Uh, all uh, the iconographic uh, imagery that's required uh, is given b b uh, by them. It's still very modern and not uh, overpoweringly so. Uh, it has stood the test of time. Uh, 
one thing that I haven't pointed out, because I rather like it myself, is the chair and the ambo. Uh, they were crafted by a local man called Sean Doherty. Uh, they would be no, he would be one of the clerks. Uh, Sean was born in 1960, and uh, I think that the chair fits in admirably. It's very, very big, but then the altar is huge. Uh, the altar was designed by Ray Carroll. The Stations of the Cross were in the original church that was replaced uh, by this building uh, in the 1960s. I used to think that they were painted by Mariani, an Italian artist who spent two years in Boncrana in the 1890s. Uh, I'm not so sure now, having looked at them again, I would think they're probably slightly later and were probably a job lot that was purchased in Italy and, and brought here. The baptismal font, uh, the stonework of this font uh, is uh, the creation of Ray Carroll, uh, whom we mentioned earlier when we were talking about the altar. And the metalwork, uh, that particular type of artwork is uh, that of Paddy McElroy. Uh, both of these men were well recognized in their fields and have artwork in numerous churches throughout Ireland. Uh, McElroy also in Nigeria and in the United States. I remember the chapel being built very, very well indeed. When it was going up, the old people was keeping an eye on it too, like, you know, and they were watching. And some of them were saying, that doesn't look a bit like a chapel at all, one way or another. And after it went up a bit higher, they were sure it was looking like a big barn or a shed or something. And even when the roof went on, I still couldn't see any sign of a church. You know, the old churches long ago, they had very steep roofs on them. This thing was nearly flat, and I couldn't understand. And somebody says, it's supposed to look like a ship turned upside down. But anyway, as it went on, on up, and then the Wundies, the Wundies appeared. And they were so small looking, compared to the old chapel had a big, long, clear glass windows. They said there'd be no light in the place. But when the glass went in, it had so dark looking from the road, that put the cabin it all together. They thought they'd get no daylight into this place whatsoever. But when they got inside, like, you know, it was absolutely beautiful to look at the, the glass. As the sunlight came through and the colours shone up, it was absolutely beautiful. There was always talking on, especially the older people, they just couldn't see this thing to be looking like a chapel. And they were brought up and was in all their life. And inside the chapel then, it was much shorter and it wasn't as wide as the old chapel, nowhere near it. And the seats was all nice and low. The, cha the chapel seats on the old chapel was high up. And you, you're, when you were on your, the rest in front of you, your arms was up under your chin. And the young people, when they would stood up, the children, they couldn't see over the top of it. But when they went into the new chapel, the priest was so close up. And everybody was on their seats and they, they loved the chapel. From that day on, every one of them loved the chapel. And another thing that they noticed very much was the big high ceiling that was in the old chapel. That was gone. The ceiling was down on top of them. They thought this was a hugely strange thing altogether. But apart from that, they all loved the chapel. They all loved the chapel.
present that to Father George for his 60th anniversary. Isn't that lovely? On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame And I love that old cross Where the deer is and best For a world of lost sinners was slain Despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear. Humble men and women, little children that you call. We are gathered here before you, and our hearts are just the same, filled with joy at such a vision as we pray. Golden Rose, Queen of Ireland, all my cares and troubles cease as I kneel with love before you. My Queen of Peace Oh, 
all your messages unspoken still the truth and silence lies so i gaze upon your vision and the truth i try to find Here I stand with John the teacher and with Joseph at your side and I see the lamb of God on the altar glorified golden rose queen of As I kneel with love before you, Lady of Nod, my Queen of Peace, and the Lamb will conquer, and the woman clothed in the sun. Will shine her light on everyone. Yes, the Lamb will conquer, and the woman clothed in the sun will shine her light on everyone. of Ireland all my cares and troubles cease as I kneel with love before you Lady of Nile my Queen Lady of Nile, my queen of peace. Everybody needs a little help sometime. No one stands alone Makes no difference if you're just a child like me Or a king upon the throne For there are no exceptions We all stand in the line Everybody needs a friend Let me tell you of mine He's my forever friend My leave me never friend From darkest night to rainbow's end He's my forever friend Even when I turn away He cares for me His love no one can shake Even as I walk away He's by my side With every breath I take and sometimes I forget him My halo fails to shine Sometimes I'm not his friend 
but he is always mine. He's my forever friend. My leave me never friend. From darkest night to rainbow's end, he's my forever. If you still don't know the one I'm talking of, I think it's time you knew. Long ago and far away upon a cross, my friend died for you. So if you'd like to meet him and don't what to do Ask my friend into your heart and he'll be you